Hi, and welcome to the École Centrale Plasma Torch Facility. My name is Megan, and today we're going to do a little tour of the facility. And I'm here with my colleagues Chris and Gilles. This is the torch itself. This is an inductively coupled plasma torch. Uh, inside the white cylinder, there's a quartz tube and a copper coil. A 4 megahertz alternating current passes through the coil, creating electric and magnetic fields which inductively heat the gas flowing through the tube. That turn it into plasma. Uh, this is the power supply that supplies power to the torch. The supply itself uh, runs on 120 kilovolt amps, and 50 kilowatts of that can be delivered into the plasma. To run the torch requires power, gas, and water. Three-phase power must be run through a frequency converter, which Chris is turning on right now. Argon is required to start the torch. This is supplied to the room by an external bottle bank and regulated flow is then sent to the flow control manifold. Compressed air, used as the experiment test gas, is also sent to the flow control manifold. Here Chris is opening the valve that provides cooling water to the torch power supply. For a radiation experiment, we use an Acton SpectroPro spectrometer and a VUV enhanced CCD camera to measure both the radial temperature distribution of the plasma and the radiation emitted by the plasma in the vacuum ultraviolet. This high resolution spectrometer has a focal length of 75 centimeters and can be equipped with nine interchangeable gratings covering the entire spectral range from the vacuum ultraviolet at 150 nanometers to the mid-infrared at 6 microns. The spectrometer is also equipped with a VUV enhanced CCD camera allowing measurements from as low as 150 nanometers. The spectrometer is calibrated in absolute intensity using two standards of radiance traceable to NIST standards, an argon mini arc for the range 120 to 400 nanometers and a tungsten ribbon lamp from 350 nanometers to 6 microns. For these vacuum ultraviolet studies, the optical path, including this optics box, is purged with nitrogen to prevent the oxygen in the lab air from absorbing the radiation from the plasma. To start the torch itself, we turn on the power supply, start the cooling water flow, and turn on the oscillator tube. While waiting for the power supply to warm up, we start the flow of argon through the coil. We use argon for startup because it is easily ionizable. When the red light comes on, warm up is complete, and we do a final check of the safety and control panel, and then turn on the high voltage system. An initial source of electrons is provided by a Tesla coil, while the voltage across the induction coil is gradually increased. Once a steady plasma is obtained, the Tesla coil is removed, and the argon flow is gradually switched to airflow. Nozzle exit diameter for the torch can be varied from 1 to 7 centimeters. This, combined with different power settings, allows us to produce heating conditions applicable to atmospheric entry, between 1 and 10 megawatts per meter squared. The three-axis finely adjustable table gives us the ability to translate the spectrometer and make accurate lateral and vertical measurements of the plasma. This is an image of the oxygen triplex spectrum at 777 nanometers that is used to determine the plasma temperature. Now that we've measured free stream conditions, We'll move on to ablation testing. Here we have four different heat shield materials. The two materials here are cork-based, ideal for low heat flux applications. Current studies are investigating the use of these materials for a CubeSat reentry mission. This material is a carbon fiber matrix that is often used as the base preform for more complex heat shield materials. This final material is called asterm. It is a phenolic impregnated carbon fiber material fabricated specifically for heat shields and is designed for 
ideal application at high heat flux conditions. The water-cooled sting holding the material is mounted on a movable crossbar, such that the sample is protected from the plasma during startup, and can be moved into the plasma when the test conditions have been reached. For the ablation experiments, we have four additional diagnostics. Here on the left, we see the first, a video camera used for taking real-time video of the sample, providing plots of the recessed surface as a function of time. On the right is the second, an infrared pyrometer used to measure surface temperature. This can be placed at various angles to observe temperature across the entire material surface. The third diagnostic, added for ablation experiments, is a camera that captures still images of the surface. These are then analyzed with a novel method that allows conversion of these raw images into surface temperature maps, giving a second measure of the surface temperature. The fourth diagnostic is an Ocean Optics Maya 2000 Pro spectrometer. This is a very compact device, allowing for mid-resolution spectral measurements from 200 to 1100 nanometers. It is particularly useful for collecting information about spectrally radiating systems through the boundary layer, and for the detection of the gray body radiation from which we can obtain a third measurement of the temperature of the ablating surface. Here we can see various ablation phenomena at work. Immediately apparent is spallation, or particles getting ejected into the flow. During asterm ablation, we also see an orange layer just next to the material surface. This is sodium from the material and shows evidence of an interaction between the material and the plasma.